this is Heather Lockett with Lasting Conversations. We're here today once again with the fabulous Valerie Staggs. Hey, Valerie. Hi. Hi. Feeling so fabulous today. <laughs> you are fabulous today, and your background is fabulous um, today with the beach and kids playing and everything like that. Last time we visited, it was you are aware of many, many hats. And so one of the hats has to do with the take on trades. So we were talking about connecting the dots with people, companies, and the new generation of workers coming into the workforce and how to talk with them, um, which is fantastic. That was episode number 51. For those of you who haven't listened yet, today's conversation segues into something I would say probably seemingly different, but since we are all human, and we all have things going on in our lives. This is really important work that you're also doing. You are a freelance writer and you have written a book called um, This Side of Heaven. And you are the founder of a fabulous um, nonprofit called Pandora's Kids. So please tell us about both of these things. Great. Well, again, thank you for highlighting this because to me it's such an important um, issue and a a great way of getting the word out to families in grief um, who are struggling um, because that's who we deal with. Um, So like many founders of nonprofits, I have a personal story and a personal experience that was kind of the um, evolution into founding a nonprofit. So my personal story is that my husband uh, died suddenly um, back in 2009 Um, I was 42 and my son was seven. And so we were in this situation where um, obviously grieving the loss of of, uh, my husband and my son's father. Um, And I have lived in this area for many, many years. I know a lot of people and um, I sought out resources as most people do when you're going through a difficult scenario. And what I discovered was there were very few resources here um, in South Florida, uh, to help children in grief. Um, and specifically for the kiddo, right. Where we've chatted before, where there's information for the grownups and the grownups have their own wheelhouse and their friend groups and things like that. But the kids are in a wholly different arena. Um, and so, and you were all blindsided. There was no lead up to this, correct? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, um, One of the things that really touched me that you had said, you did a little presentation was that notion of that the kids are in this odd middle. They are sad, but then they're looking at their mom or their dad or whoever else is in the household also sad. And so where do they go with their own grief? Right. Yeah. And as a parent, um, you know, one of the things we've always tried to do with our children is to protect them and we want them to be happy and cared for and feel secure. And so when you're dealing with the loss of a parent or a sibling or somebody else in your child's life, you know, our our normal response is to to try to protect them and we don't want them to be sad. Um, But it is a normal response, obviously, for a child who's lost a loved one. Um, to be going through those stages of grief that we all hear about. Um, And so as a parent trying to help a child, you know, there's this dynamic of you don't really want them to be sad. um, But in reality, you know, you have to deal with that as as a perfectly normal, natural emotion that comes out of that. Um, So it's it's a difficult uh, time, obviously, in your life in general. And then it's difficult in dealing with your child's grief while you're trying to deal with your own grief. How did you find you were able to navigate that as a matter of fact? And, you know, sometimes when things like this happen, the notion of showing up for school and functioning well, um, and again, the grownups in their own way, their boss might understand, um, you know, take a few days off or take what you need, but a school setting can be actually different. And so, and maybe back then, um, I would like to think now that there's a lot more compassion and wiggle room for the kids and their attendance and all of that. So tell us those those days of how that was able to come, you know, how were you able to to surf those waves? I'm looking at photos of the <laughs> folks with their surfboard in the background. So how were you able to surf those very rough waters? Not very well. <laughs> to be honest and that's you. okay too. Sometimes we all <laughs> have to fall apart and maybe our kids need to see 
that. And you mentioned about protecting, and I think you're so true. We're right. We're so wanting to shield our kids from everything, and that would include emotion and falling apart. So, yeah. Yeah, so the dynamic is different for everybody. Um, for right. me in particular, um, I am a pretty independent, um, driven person. And just in general, I have been my whole life. Um, and I am the person that most people look to as being this kind of pillar of strength and how, you know, I can kind of navigate through a number of very difficult situations and seemingly make it look like it's not affecting me. Um, so in my own personal journey, um, I was told by, you know, people like, well, you'll, you're strong, you're doing really well, you're going to make it through it. Um, and I didn't feel that way at all. So my expression and what was therapeutic to me as a writer was to put it all on paper. Um, and that's where the book emanated was just my personal kind of memoir during that one year after the death of my husband, just authentically sharing my story and, um, you know, uh, that was very cathartic for me. Um, but again, everybody's journey is different. Um, that was mine though. So what is this side of heaven? That's the title of your book. So what have you found this side of heaven to be? And what were those conversations that you were having that birthed your book? Yeah. So I've been, um, a, a reader my whole life. Um, and when, you know, I lost my husband, I sought to find other memoirs of widows um, in my scenario. And there's some wonderful memoirs out there um, about grief and loss. Um, the Year of Magical Thinking is the one that a lot of people think of, which is Joan Didion, a magnificent yeah, it's writer. It's like one of the, I just got the little tingles. So yeah, that, <laughs> that, that's um, huge. Yeah. That's a good one. A wonderful book. Joyce Carol Oates wrote one, um, another amazing author um, about the loss of her husband. But what I found as a young widow was that um, I could not find a book that resonated with me being in the situation of being relatively young in my life and also yeah. having a young child um, in dealing with grief. So um, that's what I shared um, on paper and which eventually evolved into the book. Um, and what has been super rewarding for me in in regards to that book is not that I sell a million of them I'm certainly not in a New York Times best-selling author um, however I hear from people somewhat on a regular basis who found the book let's say on Amazon and read it and it resonated with them and it made them feel less alone in their own grief journey um, right. so that has been really rewarding to me to hear is that you know, through my own authentic, which the, at times the book is is very raw, um, that that really was able to help other women um, or other people in grief um, navigate that experience a little bit better. That sounds really beautiful. And uh, so the book is called The Side of Heaven. So throughout those years, so this was a number of years ago, your your son was young, and now he is, um, help me with that math. How old 21. Is he? 21. <laughs> Cheers to 21. So he's, a, he's an adult, but a young adult. And yeah. we'll tap into this, uh, another question later, is it where are the resources for the young adults? Because one of the things that has been your focus was on the elementary and middle school children um, who have lost their loved ones. So let's go ahead and talk about Pandora's Kids and how it was that you founded that. Sure. So as I said, my son was seven, um, mm -hmm. uh, was going through a very, very difficult time um, acting out at school. Um, uh, and his response was more anger. It wasn't really sadness. And, and that right. is an emotion that a lot of people don't can't relate to. They expect you to be sad, but they don't expect you to be angry. Um, and so I was struggling with how to help him. Um, and I could not, as I mentioned, find any resources. Um, there's a fair amount of therapy. So talk therapy with young children. Um, however, my son did not want to talk about it. He did not want to draw pictures. Um, that was just, he wasn't going to do it. Um, so about two years after my husband died, um, I put my son's name is Ryan. I put Ryan in a summer camp at a place called School of Rock, where the kids get to learn how to be a rock They're star. Awesome. Which is yeah, school. Cool. Um, and I went to pick him up and he was sitting next to another little girl who I'd never seen before. And they're having an in-depth conversation for two nine-year-olds. 
And uh, when I got him in the car, I said, like, who's that girl? And he said, her name's Zoe. And I said, what were you talking about? And he said, well, her dad died too. And so we were talking about that. And it just all of a sudden hit me that um, what he needed and what probably a lot of other kids needed was just to connect with another child who was going through the same thing um, to realize like that they're not alone and that they're not um, oftentimes what children feel is not only the loneliness, but they're singled out as this kid who lost his dad. Um, right. Don't want that. Um, and so that's how the idea for Pandora's kids came into play was that to provide kind of this opportunity for kids to get together and to hang out and do fun things with other kids that are in their same situation um, to realize I'm not alone and I'm not just this odd one out who's the only one who's lost a parent or a loved one. So this is um, not grief counseling per se, but this is now the living life part, but within the cocoon, if you will, of those who have shared um, a similar fate, if you will, that they can have, find support within each other, really kind of peer to peer. Is that, am I getting that right? Yeah. So we do not do what I would say is traditional therapy. We don't ask the kids to talk about it. We don't mm -hmm. require them to draw anything um, or to do anything that they don't want to do. Um, what we do is put them in shared experiences, meaning things that kids like to do. So art, music, um, uh, exercise, athletics, those types of activities. Um, and we put them in these situations where they're just having fun together. They're doing something they all enjoy. And we're just opening the door for those, those kids to realize like they're all the same. They all have a grief experience. And if they choose to talk about it, that's great. And if they don't, that's fine too. Um, but just putting them consistently in these um, groups where they know everybody is just like me and it allows them to see um, you know, the, the bigger picture of like, yeah, I'm not the only one and allows them also to form those friendships that we've seen happen over many years, um, between kids who are going through similar circumstances. That sounds so fun. What, what kind of programs do you have? Do you have after school or do you have weekly or monthly or the summer? Tell us about some of the programs and how the kids get together. And then I'll go ahead and say, how are you staffed? Are there volunteers? And do some of the older kids kind of do things and activities with the littles? Yeah. So when the, when my first founded Pandora's kids, what we were doing was every month we had a, a day, a uh, Saturday or Sunday, typically sometimes like a Friday night um, where we would have activities like bowling or putt -put golf or trampoline park, or we went to water parks, that type of thing. Um, and so the families could expect to have that every month. Um, unfortunately, during COVID, as we all know, we didn't do any in-person events. Uh, so that kind of put a damper on everything that we were doing. Um, so coming out of COVID, we restructured a little bit. And what we are doing instead of doing these monthly events is to have um, a series of events for each le age level. So for instance, we are launching a, a surfing program that starts next month. These are for our teenagers. Um, so our teens can uh, come out uh, through a series of four sessions. They're two-hour sessions. Um, it's run by a local surf shop that's very popular with young people. And uh, the kids can learn how to surf if they've never surfed before. Or if they have, they can get some um, upgraded instruction on what they're doing. Um, and again, just this opportunity to all share this activity of surfing, all kids of the same age, so all teenagers, um, and having that opportunity again to realize I'm not alone, um, but in the context of just doing something that they enjoy doing. Um, so that's what we're launching for the teens. We're trying to get a art program off the ground um, with Armory Art Center. Oh, um, cool. Yeah. For our little ones, so our elementary school age kids. Um, and then for middle school, we're playing around with a couple ideas. We have a um, music uh, partner that is eager to um, launch a music program where the kids would get to experience different instruments, learn about writing music, what it would be like to play in a band, that type of thing. Um, and we're also looking at an equine program um, using a, a horse facility that's here locally um, to engage with the kids on that level as well. So um, those are the kind of programs we're looking to get off the ground. Um, we are looking for more and more families because coming out of the pandemic, what has happened with Pandora's kids is a lot of our kids 
have aged out. So my original kids are off to college and living their lives and doing great. Well, yay for all of that, first of all. <laughs> right. cheers, cheers to the to the young adults now spreading their wings and being part of the world. Um, but this is interesting to me, and, and you had mentioned this the other day, because my question is, well, what do you need um, from all of us here? And you are well-funded, although funding is always very helpful, I'm sure, yeah. But it was the lack of families, the lack of kids, as a matter of fact. And so it's a bit surprising to me. Tell us more about where is everybody? Because darned if there isn't a lot of stuff going <laughs> on there. You know, the kiddo could really use a, use some help yeah, or I mean, some fun. It's, it, this, this whole thing is helpful, but this is the fun part of the help. Yeah. Yeah. Statistically, it's... Uh wider spread than you think grief with children um at a younger age um so when i founded pandora's kids i thought my problem would be that i would not have enough money and i would have too many kids based on the statistics that i know are out there and the actual reverse has happened so i am thankfully in good shape financially um and we are having a challenge finding the kids um so we like to connect with schools churches synagogues um, other children's organizations like your boys and girls clubs and your after school programs um, and try to just spread the word that we are a resource. I will tell you, having gone through the experience myself um, and trying to uh, be a single parent who's holding down a job and raising a child, like these are just very busy people um, yeah. and very stressed out and, and in this situation of grief. Um, and so I think a lot of the challenges are just trying to connect with them and help them ease their burden a little bit by providing these programs that can give them a couple hours to say your kids in good hands and we're you know uh, putting them in a program that although it's not traditional therapy does help with their grief scenario quite a bit well as you were talking what i was wondering is if because like you said life has to continue and if especially for the younger parents who are having to hold down their jobs and keep everything together. And then there's baseball practice or ballet or whatever for the kids to be involved in. But I have to wonder if, have you found that sometimes the parents might lose sight of if, if I keep my kid busy in all these activities, is there a little bit of a disconnect missing out on what you're trying to do is the kids can have this as an activity because maybe they aren't covering up with, let's just get back to our regular lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's again, having navigated it myself, like, right. Um, Is there I, a balance to all of that? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. I mean, a, a lot, most of our families, it's a parental situation where the mother or the father has died. Um, yeah. Um, I only had one child, but I have families who have multiple kids. So imagine yeah. like you've lost your life partner and you're trying to take on the role that two parents used to have with one parent. Right. Um, and, you know, so that, yes, taking them to baseball and ballet and all of the things and dealing with oftentimes behavioral issues in schools that relates to the grief that the, the kids are going through. I mean, it's just a lot. Um, so I my heart goes out to anybody who's trying to navigate that because I've been there and I know what it feels like. And right. Um, so, well, it's that's just it. Yeah. When you were saying, if the kids are acting out, okay, sometimes the, the grownups in the room, so to speak, might forget, well, this is because of a sadness, you know, as we know, anger really is sadness covered up. Right. And it comes out all sideways and everything else. So this is where organizations like yours is really invaluable to offer a different um, opportunity for that normalcy, all the while kind of shepherding through to know that it's it's a bad club to belong to, but we're all in this together in this particular in right. this particular way. Yeah, and our families, like the parents and the guardians, get to know each other as well. So there is a right. support system for them in that just knowing like there's somebody else that they can talk to um, at an event and kind of tell what's happening with their, with their own child and get some advice or some insights from other parents going through the same thing. Um, right. So Are you, we, try to, oh, sorry, go ahead. we try to, to provide as much support as we can um, within the Pandora's kids website. I have 
put a lot of resources for whether they be books or other organizations um, or other programs or podcasts or whatever that people may um, find helpful. So we're trying to just give parents and children as much um, support and resources as possible. And thank you for that. And I was um, actually going to tap into, have you found, so you're in South Florida, this is kind of a two-pronged question. Do you foresee Pandora's kids branching into other areas of the country or even internationally, comma, have you found other groups a little bit similar in other places? You're a good uh, dot-to-dot connector as we got mm-hmm. to the other interview, yeah. but what are you finding in other states or other areas? There's a couple organizations around the country like us. Mm-hmm. Um, the And there's one in Broward County called Tomorrow's Rainbow that we work with um, uh, or have worked with in the past and are trying to get some programs up here in Palm Beach County that they run, um, which would be wonderful. Um, so there are definitely other grief resources, as I said, around the country or south of us here from Palm Beach County. Um, the going mentality and the going thought process is always traditional therapy. Um, that's what I've found. That's what I, t- what people always ask, well, is he in therapy? <laughs> and, uh, and I think that that's wonderful. I went through therapy myself. Uh, my son did some therapy and he has over the years. Um, and I think that that's a big component of dealing with life situations, whether that be grief or anything else that's challenging in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also not the be all to end all. So, uh, I think it, I would love to see more grief resources. I would love to see us spread to other areas of the country um, because it is, in my opinion and my own experience, a hole that is not filled in a lot of places um, that is much needed. Um, just that idea of like kids can still have fun um, and do it within the context of having um, other kids just like them in the same room or on the same beach or whatever they're doing. Um, so you know, I I would love to see it spread. I don't think there's enough resources like us um, around the country. um, And I think it's much needed. Would you, would you want to branch out, excuse me, and grow Pandora's Kids? Um, When we originally founded the organization, the thought process was that, you know, kids are online all the time. And so we Mm. had this kind of idea of like eventually building it into almost an online activity a support system so kids regardless of where they were in the country or maybe the world um could go into a safe secure forum and mm-hmm. um, be part of an activity that was fun um right. game based something of that nature um that is a huge lift uh, <laughs> so while i'm always like looking for the next thing and i'm i consider myself a visionary in a lot of this stuff uh that's not something i want to tackle yet um but you know who knows maybe someday down the road Uh, we can get there. Well, you know, visionaries, we hold the vision, but we certainly need a very big team to help these things come to fruition. So, um, yeah, I guess in the one step at a time, the other thing that I feel like I would like to tap into, and maybe because as we know, there's, this is so much bigger than just the United States. Um, There's global things in our face right now, and people are truly afraid. Mm -hmm. And this would include the the kiddos. Um, And so I know different countries and different cultures have their own way of of coping and dealing with death and things like that. And the United States, I think this is leading me to my question. We have sort of um, shut it down almost, and we don't talk about it and have it as part of our, our communal community practice to talk about somebody's passing. So um, this is leading me to one of the things that you had been mentioning is it's been hard to talk to the schools or that you've run into this odd disconnect of where it w- you would have thought it would have been a little bit easy to to speak with someone and they'd say, sure, yeah, here, give me your brochures and I'll tell everybody. And yet that really hasn't happened. Um, so speak to some of these things. I find it fascinating. Yeah, so it's, I, I run, as part of Pandora's Kids, I run one run a group called Wine and Widows. And um, 
and it's widows who get together to drink wine. And, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, the problem with grief in this country, and I don't know if it's just the U.S., but people don't know what to say. They don't know how to act. They don't know how to treat you. Like, so you feel like kind of this pariah or this person that like, you know, suddenly you're not who they know, like um, suddenly you're this other person and they don't, even though you've been friends for 20 years, they don't know what to say to you. They right. don't know how to act. <clears throat> and and so it's this bizarre thing. And yet when you think about it, everybody's going to, this, mm -hmm. this is something that happens to everybody. This is natural. And even if it's not a parent, maybe uh, somebody's own parent, the, the kid's grandparent has passed away and those are waters to navigate as well. Right. So we have in our wine and windows event, we compare notes on like the most inappropriate things people say. <laughs> it's kind of dark. You want to give us a couple? <laughs> well, I, I think I will, I will lob a couple up, which is, well, you're young, you'll find somebody else. Yeah. Or this too shall pass, which yes, eventually that is true. Or he's or, in a better place. That's one I don't place. Really like. Right. Um, Why be sad at all? Because right. you know you still have your kids, or you yeah. Know, stuff, so. Right. Um, and I feel for people because I was that person. I remember going to funerals before my husband passed away and thinking, I don't know what to say. Because <laughs> like, right. you don't want to say anything inappropriate. You don't want to make them sad. Uh, so you just don't know what to say. So you fall back on the "I'm sorry for your loss" kind of line, uh, which right. is always. I find humorous because I'm like, I didn't lose him. <laughs> I like know where he is, but like, that's just my personal uh, <laughs> perspective. But yeah, he's not in the house. And I, <laughs> I remembered a, a funeral of a dear friend of mine who was a mom of young boys at the time. And quite honestly, I hadn't been to that many funerals in my life, interestingly. Mm -hmm. And I walk in and he was getting hugs and everything from people. And I just found myself saying, this sucks. And she had been ill for a long, I, I just said, this sucks. And he looked at me and said, yeah, mm -hmm. this really sucks. Yeah. And there, that was it. That's all there was to say in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually a little story in my book exactly about that, where um, mm -hmm. one of the women who was in administration in my son's school at the time had recently lost her husband too. Um, and we had this conversation and, uh, and that's exactly what I said. This sucks. And, and it so resonated with her because I, I mean, that's just the, the situation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I have people call me all the time and go, my sister's husband just died. I don't know what to do. Like, what do I do? Um, and I just like to remind people they're the same person that they were before. Like they're still your friend who enjoys going out for a glass of wine or who still likes playing pickleball or like who still wants to be invited to things, who still like wants right. to laugh in addition to crying on your shoulder. Um, so, you know, don't try to treat them any differently. Um, you know, uh, ask them what they need or if they don't know, like, you know, you know, they love cookies, you know, they love a good bottle of wine, like, you know, just make that effort to, to be there. Um, and, and have that, whether it's your friend or your sister, whoever that same relationship that you had before, you know, this grief scenario, um, right. and that, you know, as I said, I know it's difficult. I just don't, we don't deal well with grief in this country at all. Um, the kids that have gone through Pandora's kids have I have mixed stories. So sometimes schools are great. Sometimes they're super supportive. Sometimes they're not. Uh, sometimes there's people in school, whether it's counselors or teachers who really help um, because, you know, they have that empathy or that ability to do so and to connect. And sometimes like my situation with my son did not go well in school the first year. They didn't understand wow. how after a year he couldn't get past the death of his dad. Um, and so you know, it's, it's, it's hard, uh, to deal with somebody, uh, who's lost somebody. Um, but again, just remember that the same person that they were before, just try not to treat them as differently. We don't want to feel like, you know, we're always going to be this different person. Exactly. And I'm, I'm thinking that the kiddos would love to feel the same as well, even though, um, maybe because their kids, they do, they, you know, because kids automatically kind of feel I'm weird, I'm different. You know, if I'm not part of the same old group, listening to the same music, wearing the same clothes, let alone something massive like this has happened. Right. Um, so I would think 
invite them to the birthday party, but understand if they have it in them to come or if they don't. Right. But yeah, still the kids don't need to be the pariah. Yeah, I mean, and, and it does depend somewhat on age, I've found. I, right. I'm not means a therapist, but um, teenagers tend to be the ones that don't want to deal with it often. Um, we had a kid who, his father died when he was 15, um, and the school would pull him out of class to send him to the school counselor because and very well intentioned they were trying to make sure that he was doing okay and did he want but to in the middle of the class time right not, <laughs> not in between classes in the Correct. middle of class yeah. yeah so you know the kid wound up actually dropping out of school because he felt like you know I don't want to be the kid whose dad died like um and so uh that's you know my teenagers I hear a lot like oh he just goes in his room or he never talks about it or she you know I like so I see that a lot in teenagers um the younger ones tend to be a little bit more like they're willing to talk about it or um engage with activities in remembrance of their parent or loved one Mm -hmm. um so it just really depends on the dynamic of the kid um and you know, how it is that they're willing or not willing to deal with any grief scenario. Do you find somehow that there's this odd demarcation, certainly by high school, that even the adults like that school, um, and I know of what school you're talking about, and I won't even go there, but (laughs) I would like to say, didn't they know better? But here's really the, the crux of my question has to do with Is there a little bit of an assumption or even an uncomfortableness speaking and getting to the heart of these kids as they're older? Maybe do the grownups, are they thinking they're already too old enough? They understand, just leave them alone. Um, Where the littles, you know, we all want to nestle in with a five and six and eight year old. But where's that disconnect of saying, no, these teenagers, whether actually truthfully, if they've lost somebody or not, they need us more than ever, whether mm-hmm. their face is on the phone, but they know when someone is able to connect with them and when they're think, just not, again, even, when they're not even trying. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. not a therapist, but what I right. will say is that it seems to make sense to me that if you could put kids in situations where they're surrounded by other kids like them, that it does open the door for them to feel comfortable in talking about their grief or what they're going through. Um, right. I think, you know, for uh, therapy uh, or school counseling or whatever happens in terms of support in in the schools or in other organizations, be them churches or uh, support systems or whatever, Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of runs the gamut. Uh, And what I remember at one point, a therapist that I was seeing at the time when Ryan was relatively young and it only been a couple of years after my husband died said to me, you know, people expect have certain expectations about what grief is and how you're supposed to act regardless of if you're a a grown-up or a child and if you're not meeting their expectations then you're they just don't understand and that is very true like we have a a certain expectation of this is what grief should look like (laughs) and if it doesn't these are their steps right and we all know the steps and like if somehow you're not adhering to what that picture is yeah. Um, then, you know, and I think that's what happened with my son and his school was like, they thought after a year, he'll be fine. And that was just the, you know, the expectation that they had. And, and you know, then when things weren't still not going so great, you know, they didn't know how to deal with that because it didn't right. fit the expectation that they had. So how else can we as a global community here help help you help these kids, as a matter of fact? Yeah, I think it's just, um, first of all, I would love whether, to say whether there, and I'm sorry to, uh, what my real thought was, mm-hmm. is especially in areas where there isn't a Pandora's kids, you know, where if our listeners are in the middle of Timbuktu, but they might know somebody that could really use a helping hand. What would you say to those parents, to the grandparents, to the school administrators, hospice yeah, so- workers, anybody? Yeah. Yeah, I think the important part is allowing opportunity for the child to talk about their loved one. Um, So what I did with my son is he didn't really want to talk about his dad. 
Um, but what I would do is bring up things that related to his dad. Or I would say, like, remember when you used to sit on the couch and eat potato chips out of the bag and watch Rugrats <laughs> with dad? And he'd be like, oh, yeah. like. And then he it would open the door for him if he if he wanted to, to, to talk about his dad a little bit more. Um, and so I think the biggest lift for kids is just, you know, even though it might be uncomfortable for you as the parent, cause you're feeling like if I bring it up, they're going to be sad. Um, but you can do it in the context of just, uh, opening the door with funny memories or, um, you know, the other day I said to my son who's now 21, <laughs> this is kind of funny. So when I first got married to my husband, I had this habit of like wadding up the dish rag and throwing it in the sink and it just drove Kenny crazy. And I saw my son do that the other day <laughs> and I said, you know, and I told him a little story like, <laughs> and he was like, oh my God, that's so funny or whatever. And he's 21 now, but, but keeping the memory of that person alive and, and not only in the context of sadness that they're gone, but in like, wasn't that a funny memory or you remind me of your dad because of this or, um, your dad would be really proud or just opening those conversations so that the kid has an opportunity to know it's not all sadness um, and it's okay to talk about um, your lo your loved ones. And even though, yes, it might open the door for, for um, somebody to feel sad, um, you still want to like keep that memory alive and and keep opening those opportunities for your child to communicate. Sure. That's, that's just a beautiful thing. Thank you for sharing all of that. And, and I was just thinking of how amazing it is, the inherent traits, um, <laughs> even if someone isn't around, but that notion of, wow, that's funny. <laughs> the, the turn of a phrase or the look of a face or the, the wadding up that can take us by surprise sometimes that, you know, your grandmother used to do that. <laughs> kind of weird here. It was just the <laughs> fun. Thing, it's like just <laughs> fun. Yeah. <laughs> you sound yeah. just like your uncle right now this is it right. okay <laughs> yeah 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 um and I know other families who do something um you know on the anniversary of, of somebody's death um that oftentimes is an important element to uh grieving as well um we took my husband's ashes to places where um that meant something to him and meant something to our family. And my son was a part of that as well. Um, so, you know, those kind of opportunities, as I said, to let um, your child know or let a kid, if they're not your child in your life, know, like it's okay to, to talk about, to remember um, and to, uh, and, and to have those, those regular um, ceremonies. If you, want to do that, that just kind of recognize the loss that you've had in your life. Right. Oh, beautiful. So what kind of um, events are you having coming up? Or do you have things for this year, the last quarter, or are you planning for 24 or both? Yeah. So right now we have the surfing program getting off the ground. That is on November 4th. Um, so anybody who has a teenager um, who's interested in that can register on our website. It's just pandoraskids.org. Um, and we would love to welcome more surfers or uh, budding surfers <laughs> to the program. Yeah. Um, for next year, um, as I said, we're trying to nail down uh, dates uh, for an arts program, music program, and equine program. Um, I always do on the registration form for our families, there's a question about what your child likes to do. Um, so I always want to learn, like, like I have a family right now who has two boys and I'm like, do they like to surf? No. Do they like music? No. Do they like art? No. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. <laughs> like what are you art. like to do? Now I'm going to bring in, how about juggling and right. all that? Yeah. Something um, else. Yeah. So on that form, I'm always looking at like, what do kids like to do? Um, so that I can, you know, potentially build programs around them. Um, because surely if they like to do it, there's probably other kids out there that like to do it as well. Um, and we've been blessed with so many amazing, uh, partnerships with local organizations and local companies that are just like, yeah, absolutely. I will help you build a music program or a, we'll bring them into Armory Arts has been great. Like bring them on. We have great programs. Um, and so, you know, we're just looking, as I mentioned, for the kids to fill them. Um, right. All of that is uh, free to our families. Um, so it's all funded by our supporters at Pandora's Kids. 
Um, so, you know, uh, regardless of any financial ability, uh, we welcome all of our families um, with these scenarios of grief, and we would love to get you into programs. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, feels like we're rounding out. Is there any one last nugget that you would love to share? Maybe something from your book or um, tying it all, all together? Yeah, there's a, uh, the last chapter of my book kind of summarizes um, uh, this idea of grief being a journey. Um, and I oftentimes remind people of that who are in the early stages. And my brother is one of them. He lost his wife to cancer about a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. um, so ironically, my parents are still alive and me and my brother, who are the only children of my parents, both lost our um, spouses. Uh, so, you know, this whole idea of like, uh, there is no time frame for all of this. Like it is an ongoing journey and it's different than what you um, envisioned in your life to begin with, but it's um, not necessarily any better or any worse. Um, it's just the way that life evolves um, and the path that it takes you. Um, and when I speak a lot about what I do with Pandora's kids or about my book, um, another thing that people often say is things happen for a reason. That is another thing that I don't like to hear. Um, you don't want to hear that on funeral <laughs> day, just saying no. <laughs> it, whether it's true or not, you just don't want to hear it on anywhere near <laughs> funeral day. Yeah. Right. And so uh, I tell I don't believe that. What I do believe is things happen, like life throws you all sorts of experiences. Um, and, you know, for me, you choose to make of that new pathway what you will. Um, and that's how Pandora's Kids and the book came about was just me finding a new path. Um, and I always tell people who are going down the same road, but behind me, years behind me, um, yeah. that you a path will emerge and um, and you will discover, you know, where that takes you. Um, and it'll be different, um, but it'll be a journey. And um, oftentimes you'll experience some things like that you never would have had you not gone through what you went through. Um, so that was, those are kind of my parting words, <laughs> I guess I would no, say. They're beautiful, though. The paths, the paths are endless, really. And uh, just when we think we have something going, maybe there's a little shift and then there can be resilience and lessons and some of the things that we don't like. And that's why sometimes it sucks. Right. And then the, the pieces that get picked up and the strength that evolves and the new friends that you make and the new friends that the kids make. Um, and that's, that's what life is all about. And, and I, um, help me with this, but what I, what's coming in is those who have already been on the other side of this planet, you know, call it heaven or wherever it is, they want us to be happy. They want us to live our lives and not, um, I don't want to say martyrdom, but you, there's, there's that piece also P E A C E the peace knowing that they want us to thrive and continue with our lives. Yeah, I mean, that's so true in that, um, I mean, I was blessed with a husband who I loved who, um, you know, uh, didn't want to die, it was accidental death. Um, I have dealt with a lot of families with different circumstances where that's mm -hmm. not the case. Right. Um, but to your point, and this is another interesting conversation widows get into is um what is the other side and like what are they happy and are they in the right place and all that stuff and um we've had conversations about psychics and <laughs> connecting with their loved ones and stuff mm -hmm. um and so you know the reality is is that uh everybody has their own experience as to what that loss looks like and what that person who died and any um things that may be unresolved or left behind. Um, but to your point, you know, uh, whether you believe in heaven or not, uh, you know, here on earth, <laughs> to what I just mentioned in terms of a journey, like this happened and 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 your your path is a little bit different. Um, so moving forward and whatever that looks like in your own life um, and taking whatever lessons or journey that you might have from whatever happened um uh it's all different so right. 
just kind of a one day at a time is what I always tell people going through it in the early stages, just take it one day at a time and see where yeah. it leads you. Sometimes a nanosecond, just one breath, mm-hmm. one breath at a time. Valerie Staggs, I really appreciate our time together here. And um, tell tell us again, your resources, where to find you on either or both or all of your uh, different hats <laughs> sure. that you wear. <laughs> uh, so pandoraskids.org is the website. There's a lot of resources for grief um, in our resource section. So I hope people will take advantage of those. If you have uh, our local family here in South Florida, you can register your child through the button on the homepage that says become a Pandora's Kids. Um, goes right to me and I will connect you um, and talk to you directly about the programs that we are offering. Uh, The book, uh, The Sight of Heaven is for sale on Amazon. $5 from every book goes to Pandora's Kids. Um, So uh, please buy the book. (laughs) Uh, I have a lot of people who buy it and give it to people who they know are in uh, a grief situation. And so hopefully it's a resource for them um, and hopefully it helps them feel like they're not going crazy um, and they're not alone. And uh, the journey that they're on is, you know, something that other people have been on before them. Beautiful. Right. We're not crazy. We're definitely (laughs) not alone. And this is why I I love having folks like yourself on the show to share of themselves and what it is they're doing to help me get word out that we're not alone. And there, here are some resources if you're feeling a certain way. So once again, Valerie Staggs, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate getting the word out. Thank you. And thanks for listening, everybody. Please be sure to like, follow, review, and share this podcast. And if you'd like to be part of the conversation, send emails to podcasts at Lasting Conversations and follow us on Facebook at Lasting Conversations. This is Lasting Conversations. We get to the heart of everything. <laughs>